morning. He's not in the tomb anymore. Jesus is risen. So we're going to celebrate it together. Let's worship him just with a joyful song this morning. And let's start off just remembering that amazing grace when Jesus shed his blood for us, for our sins, and broke the power of sin and death as we start off this morning. Let's just enjoy him together. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be saved. I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. You would lay down your life, then I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Pouring down 
angels cries Darkness rejoices And lost But then Jesus arose with that
Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat Resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. soldiers watched in vain it was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain for our God has robbed the grave our God has robbed the grave
There's only one name that is worthy There's only one king on the throne He is light of our salvation All praise belongs to Him alone There's only one way to the Father One love that melts the heart of stone He is the life and resurrection All praise belongs to Him alone Look to the Lamb See the Son of God, the Savior crucified. See the crown of thorns that nails His wounded side. He is worthy. Look to the Lamb. See the One who is forever glorified. There is love and there is fire in His eyes. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is the Alpha and Omega. He was and is and is to come. Shouts of glory. His name is Jesus Christ our God. His name is Jesus Christ our God. Look to the land. See the Son of God, the Savior crucified. See the crown. The nails is wounded side. It's worthy to the land. See the one who is forever glorified. There is love and there is fire in his eyes. He is worthy. Is the elders by the creatures cry, saints and angels glorify, the anthem echoes day and night. Like fire, hair like wool, voice like many waters roar, matchless and most beautiful. Worthy. The elders bow, the creatures cry, saints and angels glorify. The anthem echoes day and night. He 
Lord, there is none like you, that you would bow down, Lord, that you would come down to earth, Lord, to rescue us, to redeem us, that you would purchase us with your own blood, Lord, that you would allow yourself to be treated in such a way by sinful men in order to redeem us to yourself. Lord, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin, Lord, for your great grace, Lord, to give us that hope and that promise of eternity. Lord, there is none like you. You are worthy of all praise for all of eternity. God, we thank you. And Lord, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for time to come together to worship you, to remember how great you are. And Lord, thank you for the body of Christ that we get to do this together. And we look forward to the day when we'll get to do this together for all of eternity with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Well, why don't you greet someone this morning and then you can have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Man, so, so great to be able to worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, we're certainly going to be digging into the Word of God uh, this morning as we remember the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but before we get into the Word, I just want to share uh, just a few announcements with you. Uh, first of all, just a reminder, we have our Wednesday evening Bible study uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, here at the church. We'll be continuing our trek uh, through that book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, and uh, just going through those Proverbs, uh, just one at a time, a chapter at a time, just enjoying that good wisdom from God's Word. If you just need to know, hey, I, I want to know, what does God's Word have to say about, you know, different uh, topics or different subjects or different things? Uh, a study through the book of Proverbs covers a lot of bases, a lot of, a lot of different topics. And so I just want to encourage you, come on out on Wednesday as we just take some time to worship the Lord and uh, just enjoy sitting at His feet and just receiving uh, from his word. And so Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the church. Uh, next, a reminder for the men. Uh, we have our men's retreat is coming up in less than two weeks. And so guys, uh, if you haven't grabbed one already, grab uh, one of these cards at the front counter. You can even get signed up today uh, for the men's retreat. You know, if you're a man and, and you want to grow closer uh, to the Lord, you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord. Um, if you want to if you want to be a man that God can use, you know, to learn what it is to just be a man who's just available to the Lord, to hear from the Lord, and to be able to just step out and, and take steps of faith to be used by God, uh, then I want to encourage you, men, come on out for the men's retreat. It's an encouraging time. It's a strengthening time. Uh, it's a time when we just get to get away from all the distractions, the regular things that we would do on a Thursday night or a Friday or a Saturday morning. And that, that's all it is, is Thursday evening through Saturday morning. 
and uh, just take some time to sit with the Lord, to hear from Him, and to enjoy Him, and just let Him work in our hearts, work in our lives, and just reveal those things that He wants to do. Um, God is so faithful just to reveal, you know, those, those you know, special things when we just get away with Him. You know, I, I'm reminded of Jesus even during His earthly ministry, how He would just get away from everything, you know, early in the morning even before the sun came up. He would get away from all the stuff that was going on just to get away with the Father, to pray to His Father, to just to receive those instructions and enjoy uh, just the presence of his father. And so as men, that's what we want to do. We want to we want to get away with the Lord just to receive from him what we need so that we can be good husbands and good fathers and good co-workers and good bosses and good neighbors and and all of those things that God has called us to be. Uh, whatever that looks like in your life, God wants to help you with that. And so men, I encourage you sign up for that. Um, the check-in on Thursdays uh, begins at 4.30, but we're not going to start until later that evening. So if you're working Thursday and you don't get off until 5 or 6, no big deal. Uh, we're going to be meeting at Altamont's, uh, which is uh, not far away. It's in uh, Shawsville, so less than 40 minutes from the church. So it's not really a long drive from here at all. And uh, you can come on out Thursday. We'll be able to spend the whole day Saturday. And, then of course, we'll wrap it up by noon on uh, on Saturday. Well, we'll have all day Friday and then wrap it up on Saturday. And this has the address, things to bring, and all of that good stuff. And so guys, definitely get signed up uh, today even if you can, uh, but definitely this week because uh, we're getting very, very close and making plans for food and uh, how many rooms and all that stuff. And so we'd like to know that as soon as we can. Uh, so you definitely sign up. You can do that at the front counter. You can sign up on the website, the ccr.life website from any web browser, uh, or you can download the CCR Life app on your phone or your tablet. And right from the church app, the CCR Life app, uh, you can sign up for anything that we have going on, especially the men's retreat uh, this week. That would be great. All right. Uh, and then lastly, an opportunity to serve. Uh, just to let you guys know about the cafe and the cafe team, you can be part of the cafe team. Uh, if you're newer here, maybe you don't, uh, maybe you aren't familiar with the cafe, but the Lord definitely has blessed us with a great space in the cafe to be able to hang out and fellowship after service, you know, to grab a, a free cup of coffee or to buy a specialty drink or, you know, they have usually some goodies in there too. Uh, to, to get, um, but it's just a great place to be able to hang out after service, enjoy fellowship with your brothers and sisters, and just spend a little bit more time with the Lord and with his people. And um, certainly we enjoy that for fellowship. We enjoy that for prayer. Many times our prayer nights are there in the cafe. But if you'd like to uh, help in just serving in the cafe, to serve the Lord in just a practical way, that's a blessing to the body of Christ. Uh, the cafe team may be for you. Um, you know, we can provide all of the training uh, as far as making coffee or, you know, just taking orders or just helping out and wiping down tables or sweeping the floor. Just very simple things that are a blessing to the body here uh, as we come to fellowship and as we come to worship the Lord. And so if you're interested in learning more about the cafe team or, or would like to join, you can see Kyle. Uh, Kyle Kenny, he oversees the cafe. You might have seen him up here. He's got the big beard and he plays the bass. Looking pretty mean, but he's not mean. He's really a nice guy. He's one of the nicest guys I know. Uh, you know, feel free to find Kyle afterwards and he can let you know about the cafe team. Uh, a great team to be a part of and, and a really neat way to be able to serve the Lord and uh, just be a blessing to your brothers and sisters. All right, that's all I have for announcements, guys. Uh, so let's do this. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word and let's open up to Matthew and chapter 28. Matthew in chapter 28. If you go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, the first book. And in Matthew chapter 28, we're going to start this morning just by reading verses 1 through 10. And then uh, I'll pray and then we'll, we'll dig in and see what we have uh, this morning from God's word. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, uh, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and 
the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards, they shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your truth, Lord. We thank you, Lord, uh, that we know that these are not the words of men, uh, but it is your word. It is your word to us, Lord. It's your love letter to us. And so, God, we just want to hear from you. We want to learn of you, Lord. We want to draw closer to you. And so, God, draw us near as we study your word this morning. Uh, reveal to us and teach us and, and speak to us, Lord, those things that we need to know and those things we need to hear. And, and Lord, work in our hearts and change us, Lord, that we would be more like you. And Lord, that we would follow after you and live with you as we go through this life. Lord, we just want to be close to you. And so, Lord, help us to do that as we read your word this morning. And we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, as we, as we stated last week, you know, this is the greatest and the most important week in all of human history. You know, as we looked at last Sunday, you may remember we celebrated Palm Sunday, uh, and there was that time, that day, that specific day, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that colt, the foal of a donkey, and uh, he presented himself to the nation of Israel as their Savior, as their Messiah, as the one that they had been waiting for, the one that had been promised, the one that had been foretold. And now here he is, Jesus riding in to Jerusalem, presenting himself to the nation. And we looked at last week just the prophecies uh, that were just fulfilled as Jesus came in, you know, with it being that very specific day that he showed up. Uh, with the song that they were singing. It was right out of the Psalms. It was a messianic psalm. And, and how he would ride in, even the city that he would ride into, you know, riding in on that donkey and, and riding into that city of Jerusalem. And then on Friday, we remembered the crucifixion and, and how Jesus went to the cross for our sin and how he was mistreated and, and the injustice of it all, that he would be put to death, even though he was innocent. Even though he was the spotless lamb, there was nothing wrong with him. There was nothing that he had ever done wrong or bad. Yet they crucified him like a criminal. And they treated him shamefully. And of course, there were many prophecies uh, that were foretelling of, of the uh, Messiah being put to death or, or, or dying uh, for the people. And we looked at some of that on Friday. And then uh, as we come to this, uh, this morning and we're, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, certainly there were many prophecies uh, that were fulfilled even in the resurrection. These things were foretold in the scriptures. And even Jesus himself, you know, during his earthly ministry, he said over and over again to his disciples that he was going to die and that he was going to rise again, that he would be raised from the dead. You may remember earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. In the Gospel of John, John records 
that Jesus was speaking about, you know, laying down his life. And it says, no one takes it from me, Jesus said, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. So this wasn't new news. This wasn't a surprise. Though the disciples had missed it for whatever reasons, they missed it. It shouldn't have been a surprise because Jesus had foretold. And there were others uh, who understood clearly what he was saying. Now, here we sit nearly 2,000 years later. It's almost 2,000 years since the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And I guess, I, I guess that, you know, the question that we would want to ask is, you know, how can we know that Jesus truly rose from the dead? How can we be assured, you know, nearly 2,000 years later, that Jesus truly did rise from the dead, that the resurrection is true? Well, I guess another question to ask is this, you know, how do we know anything from history? How do we learn or have any assurance or confidence of anything that we learn in history? And I would say that number one would be this, is eyewitness testimony. You know, just as in a court system today or things that happen today, what, what is the judge, what is the jury, what are the lawyers looking for? They're looking for eyewitness testimony, those that were there who saw what happened because we can't be everywhere. We're not in the place where certain events happen, and so we rely on others who are eyewitnesses of those things to give us their testimony to see, okay, this is what happened. I wasn't there. I didn't see it with my own eyes. I, I wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. I, I didn't live in Jerusalem when all of these happened. Uh, but there are eyewitnesses who saw these things, and they have a record of what they saw. They wrote down a record of what they saw. And so anything in history and anything uh, even today, we rely heavily upon eyewitness testimony. And so what we want to do is just confirm, hey, can we trust the eyewitnesses? Are, are, are they witnesses that we can believe? Are there holes in the story? Are there contradictions? Are, are there problems or issues? Is there a reason they're not trustworthy? And the great thing is, is that we have four accounts. We have four gospel accounts, you know, that God has given us in his word. The gospel of Matthew, he was an eyewitness. The gospel of Mark, and he was an eyewitness of some things, but he also got a lot of information from Peter, who was an eyewitness of many other things. And so that was a great source for Mark as he wrote his gospel. The Gospel of John, who was an eyewitness to these things himself. And then, of course, the Gospel of Luke. And Luke uh, was not an eyewitness of all of these things, uh, but being a physician and being very meticulous, he conducted many interviews, and he interviewed eyewitnesses of these things and recorded these things down uh, for the Gospel of Luke and then part of Acts as we're going through Acts on our normal Sunday morning study. And so what we find as we compare all of these is that they are trustworthy, that, that, that the stories line up. And that even in the different details that each might have, they all connect together like a wonderful puzzle that you can put together and get the whole story as you look at all four of these Gospels. I like what Peter declared in Acts in chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, he said, This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. You know, this was just a short time, uh, maybe a month and a half or something like that after the resurrection. And Peter, he says, look, we're eyewitnesses. We saw, yes, he, he, was, he was dead. He was in the grave, but God raised him up and we are all witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Peter being one of those eyewitnesses. Luke would earlier record in that book of Acts, he said, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that's one of those things we want to remember is it wasn't that Jesus just rose from the dead and then said, hey, love you guys, see you later, and then disappeared. He was there for 40 days, over a month. They're in Jerusalem. They're in the area of Galilee. And there were many eyewitnesses to the resurrection because Jesus, he was around for 40 days. You know, he sat, he, he drank, he, he ate food. You know, he cooked food, you know, by the Sea of Galilee. 
You know, he, he was a body. He wasn't a, he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't floating around, but he had a body. He was resurrected, and they saw him, and they were eyewitnesses of it. You know, I like also what Paul wrote a little later in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. Paul writes this, that, that Jesus, he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, uh, then by the twelve, it was by the apostles, and after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. He said, look, I rem- there was this one time, and, and, and I was told about, and, and I talked to these people, and so I'm reminding you Corinthians about this, that there was a time when Jesus appeared, and there was 500 people there that saw Jesus all at once. And he says, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. He said, look, some of those eyewitnesses, they've died. They've fallen asleep. But, but the, the majority of them, they're still alive. That's quite the bold claim to make. All anyone had to do is say, hey, okay, uh, Paul, what, what are you talking about? And they could go and talk to those people. And they'd tell them, hey, yeah, yeah, we saw him. I remember we were here, we were doing this, and Jesus appeared, and we had a big group of us, and we all saw him, you know. And they were amazed, and they were in awe. And he goes on to write in Corinthians, he says, after that, he was seen by James. You know, why is that significant? James uh, was the brother of Jesus, really the half-brother of Jesus because uh, of Joseph and uh, the uh, uh, inception by the Holy Spirit and all of those types of things, Um, the incarnation, um, the virgin birth, and all of those types of things. Uh, But James was the half-brother. Now, James was a doubter. James didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but yet... James, his, his even his doubting brother, saw him and was an eyewitness to the resurrection. He became a believer after that, and he would write uh, the letter of James or the book of James. And it says, then by all the apostles, they saw him again. And then last of all, we have seen, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. You see, Paul, he wasn't a believer when Jesus was raised from the dead. Paul, his name was Saul, and really, he was a terrorist. He terrorized the church. He terrorized Christians. He saw to it that they would be stoned and put to death. He saw to it that they would be imprisoned, that their families and their homes would be broken up, and they would be thrown into prison for believing in Jesus. And you say, man, how how does someone like that end up believing in the resurrection, well, he saw the Lord. You remember he was on his way to go track down some more Christians, and the Lord Jesus, resurrected, appeared to him, and it changed Paul's life. No longer to be Saul, but to be Paul, the Apostle Paul. And God would use him in a marvelous way. And I think, man, what an amazing thing, you know, that you know, we have all of this eyewitness testimony and all of these records that God has preserved down through the ages for us to be able to read and analyze and compare and understand these things today. You know, he was seen by many, you know, over 500 at one time. He was seen by his half-brother who didn't believe in him. He was seen by Paul, you know, who was not a believer and actually was a persecutor of the church, but he ended up believing in the resurrection and, and, it, and it changed his life because he met Jesus. You know, and each one of these were willing to die for what they believed. You know, this wasn't some great hoax. This wasn't some great trick that they were trying to play on the world. But each one of the apostles, uh, each one of those early disciples, they were willing to be put to death in brutal ways for what they believed. And they would not recount. They, they, They would not renounce their faith. He said, I believe in the Lord. I, I, I believe in what I've seen, and I've seen the risen Lord, and I know that it's true. And they went to their deaths. They went to the grave, believing that and declaring that. Now, outside of that eyewitness testimony, which we certainly have much of uh, throughout the Scripture and even within history, um, why else should we believe in the resurrection? Uh, well, I would say for, for number two, it was because the, the tomb itself was so securely guarded. Now look uh, back at Matthew in chapter 27, just the previous chapter, at the end of the chapter, verse uh, 26. Matthew 27, verse uh, 62, I'm sorry. I got a little backwards there. 27, 62. It says, On the next day, which followed the death of, uh, or the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. 
saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver, and they call Jesus a deceiver, they're the deceivers, but they said how that deceiver after three days, they, that he said, after three days, I will rise. Now, what's interesting because the high priests and the, uh, the religious leaders, they were enemies towards Jesus. Jesus didn't want to be their enemy, but they were enemies towards Jesus. But yet they heard what he said and they understood what Jesus was saying is that he would rise again after three days. So even even they knew what Jesus was talking about. And so they warn uh, the Roman governor there, Pontius Pilate, and say, hey, look, this is what this guy was claiming. And so we need to do something about this. In verse 64, therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. And so the tomb was sealed and the tomb had a guard set. Now understand this, the, the tomb was already closed. There was a giant rock. It would take several you know, strong men to be able to roll this out of the way. So it's already closed with this giant stone. But the, what the Romans would do is they would come and they would hammer in some metal spikes into the rocks on either side and then have some rope or chain or something across those spikes to seal the stone closed. And there will be a Roman seal that's placed upon that. And with that Roman seal, what that meant was this, you know, and anyone who saw it would have understood exactly what it meant, is that, look, Rome has sealed this. It is now the property of Rome, and you better not touch it. You better not mess with it. You better not open it. Because if you do, you will have all of the authority and all of the power of Rome and the Roman military coming down upon you. Uh, to hunt you down and to deal with you, to bring justice against you because you have broken their seal. So the seal, it was a big deal. You know, it was, it was a major uh, thing uh, for people to see and to consider. No one was going to mess with the seal. Well, almost no one. <laughs> And then, of course, there was a Roman guard uh, that was there, and I've got a picture of this mean guy, uh, but, but there would have been more than one. You know, a typical guard uh, would have been uh, four guards on duty. Uh, typically, from history, we've learned a guard would consist of four guards on and then uh, the rest off. And so it would be four by four. They would be on for four hours, and then they would have a break. And so there could be anywhere from 8, 12, 16 guards, just depending on how much of a threat they thought it was, uh, that were around in the area, four standing attention on guard, and the rest just kind of has, has, the, has the time off to rest to get ready for their guard. And so there was Roman soldiers that were there, and not only Roman soldiers. Remember that it was the, the uh, high priests, and those from the temple that were concerned about these things, the temple had a temple guard of their own. So not only would there be the Roman guard, but the temple guard, they would have had some soldiers or some guards set around as well. So we're talking about uh, a very well-guarded area. Now, if the area is so well-guarded, how was the tomb opened? Uh, look again at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. He says, now after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, what's the first day of the week? Sunday. You know, why do we gather together on the first day of the week? You know, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus. We come together on the first day of the week remembering, hey, we're Christians. Uh, we belong to God all because of what Jesus has done for us. He rose again on Sunday, on the first day of the week. And it says, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Now, they weren't expecting it to be open. They even had that question in one of the other Gospels, well, how are we going to get the tomb open? Uh, but we do learn from Luke also uh, that they had gathered together spices and fragrant oils. They were expecting to go and somehow get into the tomb so that they could anoint the body of Jesus. They were expecting a dead Jesus in the tomb. That was their expectation. In verse 2, and it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, 
For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The guards were like, man, we never saw anything like this before, right? And they just pass out, you know, they become like dead men. They just faint and fall over in the presence of this great angel. And so we see it was the angel that opened the tomb. Now, what was the uh, guards uh, or the Roman soldiers' story? Like, what happened to them? It says they were like dead men. They didn't die. Uh, they were still alive. They just fainted or passed out or something. Uh, but what ended up happening to them? Look down at verse 11. It says, now, uh, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole, away, stole him away while we slept. <laughs> and if this comes to the governor's ears, which it will, uh, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. And I think, man, how sad for these religious leaders. They even have the testimony of these Roman soldiers. These were not followers of Jesus. These were not believers in Jesus, but yet they had seen something miraculous. They had seen God work right in their midst. And as they go and tell these religious men what God had done, they immediately say, oh, well, let's come up with an alternative story. Here's some money, and uh, let, let's figure out how to cover this up instead of repenting. Instead of, instead of realizing that they were wrong and, and the way they were going was wrong, but that Jesus is really the Messiah and God really is at work here. Instead of recognizing that, they just ignore it and they try to cover it up. Now, I guess a good question is this. You know, why is the story of the chief priests and, and of the Roman soldiers here, the guard here, why is it untenable? You know, why is that hard to defend or, or why is that a weak story we might say. Now, for one, you know, the Roman soldier falling asleep on his post or on his guard was punishable by death. They could be put to death for falling asleep while on guard, on official duty. Now, the other question is this, you know, if they were all asleep, if they all fell asleep, wouldn't they have heard the loud noise of that giant stone being rolled away? You know, again, it would have taken several very strong men, you know, you know grunting and, uh, you know, trying to roll that thing out of the way. You don't do that quietly. The stone itself is very big and, and very heavy, it would have made a lot of noise all on its own. And, and they mean to say that no one woke up with all of that ruckus, with all of that noise going on. And, and, and to add to that, if all were asleep, how did they know it was the, the disciples? <laughs> If you're asleep, I mean, you, you didn't see. Everyone was asleep. Yeah, but it was the disciple. Well, how do you know you were asleep? Um, the priest told us to say that, you know. It just doesn't hold up. It doesn't make sense. If they were asleep, how could it be that the disciples uh, stole the body? They wouldn't have seen it. They wouldn't have known because they were asleep. And, you know, again, to add to that even more, before the resurrection, the disciples were not brave men. They were afraid. They were hiding. You remember when Jesus, he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did the disciples do? They all, they fled away. They ran away. They were afraid. And there were a couple that were brave enough to come back around. We know John did, and we know that Peter did. But even in that much bravery that Peter had to come and see what was going to happen to the Lord as they were tr putting Jesus on trial, what did Peter do three times? He denied the Lord because he was afraid. These were not brave men that are going to go and take on Roman soldiers and temple guard who have swords and shields and, and, and are military men and, and know how to fight. They're not going to go and take them on to try to get the body of Jesus out of the tomb, it's just not going to happen. And again, if we can add something else 
you know, to show how ridiculous their story is. Well, where's the body? No body, no crime, right? That's what they say. Well, where's the body? If they stole the body, then where is it? They could never produce a body. That's all they had to do was turn Jerusalem upside down and find Jesus' body. And they would have said, see, look, he's still dead. You know, they, they were trying to trick us. They were trying to lie to us, but they could never do it because, of course, Jesus was risen from the dead. Now, after the resurrection, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, those same disciples, they were very brave and they were very bold. And, you know, they certainly believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And the question for us this morning is, you know, do we believe? Do we really believe that for ourselves? Do we believe that Jesus, yes, he died for my sin, but then three days later he rose again from the dead, showing his power over sin, showing his power over the grave and over death itself, and that he did it for us? Do you believe that for yourself? You know, why, why is the resurrection so important? You know, why do we make such a big deal about the resurrection? I think Paul put it well when he wrote in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. He said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. It's empty. <laughs> you know, your faith has no power. It can't do anything because you are still in your sins. Still in your sins. If Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, then that means we are still in in our sins. You see, the penalty for sin is death. And we are all guilty. Every one of us. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has offended God in some way, in, in multiple ways. And the penalty for that sin, the, the, the scripture teaches us, is death. And God, He is holy, He is pure, He is fully and, and, and completely good. And our sin is what separates us from him. Our sin holds us apart from a holy and just and pure God. And we cannot approach him in our sin. But it says in the scripture that Jesus, he stood in our place, that he became the substitute for us, that though we deserve to die, we deserve death for all of eternity because of our sin, Jesus stepped up. Or Jesus stepped down, we should say. He stepped down to earth and he stood in our place and he paid the ultimate consequence or the ultimate price for our sin and he went to the cross in our place so that we wouldn't have to. He died in our place. You know, this was one of the scriptures we looked at on Friday in Isaiah 53, 5. It says, he was wounded for our transgressions. Jesus, he put himself through this for us. He was wounded. His body was wounded, and it was for our transgressions. And transgression is sin. Transgression is God draws the line, and we see the line, and we know the line, and we step over the line anyway because we feel like it or because we want to or we think we know better. And the scripture says this, man, Jesus, he was wounded for our transgression. He took the, he took the pain or he took the penalty for that transgression, every time we've done that, every time we've saw the line and we know we shouldn't and we did it anyways, it says this, that Jesus died for you. Jesus died for that. He has paid for that sin. He has paid for it totally. He has paid for it completely. And it says he, is, he was bruised for our iniquities. And, you know, iniquities is still sin, but it's a little different. It's like what we're born with. We're born with a sin nature. And it's just the sin, the corruption, you know, the bent that we have, that we, that we just have, you know. It maybe isn't even a conscious thought. You know, you just naturally do the wrong thing. Or you naturally sin in some way without giving it much thought. It's iniquity. It's just in us. It's in our heart. It just comes out so freely. And it says this, that Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. Not only the things we willfully do against the Lord, but even those things we don't even realize that we're doing it wrong. The scripture says this, Jesus died. He was bruised. He was punished for that iniquity, for your iniquity and my iniquity. And he has paid for it. He has paid for it in full. And it says the chastisement 
for our peace was upon him. He was punished, chastised for our peace so that we could have peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. He was whipped and, and he was beaten and we know he was crucified all so that we could be healed. And certainly God heals in miraculous ways. He can heal our health and heal our bodies. God is still up to that type of work today. Uh, but more importantly than the physical healing is the spiritual healing to heal our hearts and to heal our souls and, and, and to uh, um, uh, revive us spiritually so that we can once again have relationship with the God who created us, who created us for that very relationship so that we can know his love so that we can enjoy him every day and know that we have all of eternity with him one day. See, Jesus came to pay for those sins and to heal us. And if he is not risen, then we are still in our sin. Jesus went to the cross for our sin, yes, but if he didn't rise from the dead, how can we know if it took? How can we know if it worked? You know, I've heard it said this way, if Jesus dying on the cross was the payment, then the resurrection is the receipt. You know, we have a receipt saying, hey, it's paid in full. He paid for my sin. Because look, he rose from the dead. The, the sacrifice was accepted. It was acceptable to the Father. And so he rose him from the dead because Jesus really was perfect. He really was God in the flesh. He really was the Savior that God had promised. And so he was able to rise from the dead. Romans crucified many, many people. They didn't come back, you know. They didn't rise from the dead, but Jesus, he rose from the dead three days later. Now, because the Lord is risen, because we know that Jesus is risen, you know, uh, that he was victorious over sin. Again, he was victorious over death and over the grave. But I guess a good question is this this morning. What can we have today because of that? What do we get to enjoy and what can we have this morning because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus and we have accepted that uh, for ourselves, his payment for our sin and, and, and desiring relationship with the living God. I will say number one is that we have hope. We have hope. You know, we live in a world without hope. Are things getting better or worse out there? Uh, I think we would all be in agreement, right? Any dissenters? Probably not. You know, man, things are getting worse, man. We live in a world without hope. And people, they, they, they don't know how bad it's going to get. They don't know what's going to happen next. And, and they don't know the answer. They don't know how to fix it. These problems are unsolvable. That's the world we live in. But you know what? Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we don't have to live hopelessly, but we get to live with hope. We have, uh, you know, in in in. When the scripture speaks about hope, it's, it's not how we might use it today. So many times we say, well, you know, I hope that we'll get to go to the beach this year or something like that, right? I hope, you know, but I'm not sure. But when the, when the scripture talks about hope, it speaks about a confident expectation. That, man, I am confidently expecting, you know, to be with the Lord. That, you know, I have hope in the Lord, and, and, and I have hope that, you know, this is not all that there is, but I have eternal life, and I'm going to get to experience and enjoy eternity with God in heaven one day, and I, and I have this hope because I get to experience a loving relationship with that very same God today as I walk through my life and, and walk through this world. You know, this life is not the end. <laughs> this life is not all there is. You know, we have hope. You know, so many in this world, they don't have hope, but we get to have that hope in Jesus. And I like what uh, Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 8, verse 11. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You. you know, the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we have God's Holy Spirit within us. And if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we have the very same Holy Spirit. He resides in us. And just as he ra raised Jesus from the dead, he's going to raise us up. He's going to bring life to our mortal bodies that we know this. When we die, it's like we read earlier, it's just like we fell asleep because we don't really die. We just move. 
You know, we move from this life and we move into eternity with the Lord. But we have life everlasting. We have eternal life even today on this side of eternity. But that's the hope. That's the promise because we have the same Holy Spirit within us. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again of the Spirit. And Nicodemus didn't know what that meant. And he said, be born again. I don't get it. I don't know how to do that. And he says, no, not, not naturally, not like you were born the first time. You must be born again of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit of God would come and take residence within you, and you would be spiritually alive once uh, again to the Lord, to be born again. Paul also wrote to, second, to uh, the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. He says, knowing that he has raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. And, you know, I love this, that, you know, we have this promise that we're going to be raised up with the Lord and presented to the Lord. You know, we don't have to fear death. And we might, again, we might fear how we will die. You know, we don't want to die in, in a very painful uh, or terrible way. You know, we, we, we hope, uh, you know, we can just, you know, die in our sleep or something like that. You know, go, go gently into the night or something. Or just very, very fast, very catastrophic, you know, where you don't feel anything. It just happens. But, you know, we might fear how we might die, but, you know, well, we don't have to fear death. Because we know this, that just as the Lord Jesus has been raised, the Lord's going to raise us up to be with him and present us to him. And so we have life everlasting. We don't have to wonder what's on the other side. We don't have to wonder, man, what's going to happen when I die? We don't have to have any of those fears. But we can have that hope and we can have that confidence, man, I'm going to be with the Lord. And how can we know that we have this eternal life? How can we receive this eternal life for ourselves? You know, it gives us very clear and very simple instructions. I love that about the Lord. He's just very clear and very simple. He doesn't make it complicated. He doesn't make it too hard for me to grasp or too hard for me to understand. He says simply this in Romans chapter 10, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Say, man, I, that I am open, I, that, that, that I, would, I would share and that, that I would say out loud that Jesus is my Lord. Yes, he's my savior. He died for my sin, and I put my trust in him for that. But he's not just my savior. He's also my Lord. He's the one that I'm going to live for. He's the one that I'm going to live with. He's the one that I'm going to follow. I want to live for him. Because of what he did for me, I just want to live for him, and I want to be with him. Wherever he's going, whatever he's doing, I want to go with him and be with him. Wherever that is, whatever he's doing. To be able to confess that with your mouth and say, he's my Lord. He's the Lord Jesus. And he says, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You know? so, so it's not, you know, the confession comes, but we know what's in our heart is what comes out of our mouth, right? So it really starts in the heart, you know, that we believe in our heart that, you know, Jesus is the Savior. He did die for my sin. And you know what? He rose again. And, you know, he is my Lord. And, and if you truly believe that, you will tell others about that. You will share that. You will share that with your families. You will share that with your neighbors. You will share that with your coworkers in appropriate times. And God can lead and, and God can show you those open doors and when it's the right time. But it's in your heart to do it because, you know what, if you've got the greatest news on the planet... <laughs> If you've got the greatest news in all of human history, you would never want to keep that to yourself. You can't help but tell others. And Paul told the Romans, hey, th this is what it takes. You know, if it's in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth and you're going to know that you have eternal life. You're going to know that you belong to the Lord. It's simply by putting your faith in the Lord. And, and, and I, I love that it doesn't mention works here. It doesn't say, hey, you have to work really hard or you better be a really good person or a really good Christian or you better read your Bible for three hours a day and pray for five hours a day and, and serve for 20 hours a, a week or something like that. He doesn't put any of those things on us. He says, you want to be saved? You want to have eternal life? Man, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that he died for you, and that his death was enough for your sin to be paid for completely. 
And if you really believe that, then you are born again of the Spirit and you have eternal life. And then we want to read our Bibles. We want to pray. We want to serve. Uh, we want to share the good news with others. We just want to because it's what's in our heart. It's not because you better or you have to. But Jesus makes all the difference in our lives. You know, what else uh, can we have today and enjoy today? Certainly, we have hope. Uh, let, let's read in verse 8 and 9 and see what it says here. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 8 and 9, it says, And so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear. They were in awe of what they saw. They were in awe of it. And great joy. And they ran to bring his disciples' word. Man, we've got good news. And they were on the run. They were ready to go share the good news with the disciples. Verse 9, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, man, they get, they get an extra blessing here. They got to see an angel. They got to learn that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now look who meets them on the way as they're running. Behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by their feet and they worshiped him. It says, man, when they left the tomb, they had great joy. And when they met Jesus, what did he say? He said, oh, rejoice. You see, this is what we have because of Jesus. We have joy in our lives because of Jesus. We can have joy in our lives as we go through the most difficult of circumstances in this world. Because it's a joy that comes from the Lord. It's not a joy that comes from our circumstances. Because joy doesn't really come from circumstances. Not true joy. Happiness, you know, it's conditional. You know, I'm happy today. It's, it, it, you know, the sun is shining and it's nice. You know, well, if it's raining and, you know, a storm blows my house over, I'm not going to be happy, <laughs> you know. But it's conditional. And though I may not be happy, you know, because something tragic has happened or something terrible has happened, I can still have joy in the midst of that because it's a joy that comes from the Lord. We can rejoice in the Lord. I like what the prophet Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 15, 16. It says, your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah said, look, I've got joy and I've got just a rejoicing in my heart. And where did it come from? You know, it, it came from just spending time in God's word. He said, you know, I, I found your word, Lord. I was reading your word and I was feeding upon it. I was, I was reading it and I was receiving it. And, and as I read God's word, I'm reminded of who God is. And I'm reminded of who I am to God. And when you remember who God is, that he's your savior, that he's the lover of your soul, uh, that he has a, a wonderful plan in eternity for you because he wants you to be with him. You have a God that loves you. When you remember that, how can you not rejoice? To remember who God is and who I am to him. That's what he says. He says, for I am called by your name. Jeremiah said, I'm reading your word. I opened my Bible and I started reading and I remembered, man, I belong to God. I belong to him. I'm one of his kids. I'm called by his name. That's, that's what we mean when we say we're a Christian, right? We're a Christian. We belong to Christ. We belong to Jesus. That his name would be upon us. We're called by his name because we belong to him. He's our savior. He's our Lord. He, he loves us and he cares for us. And, and then he says this, O Lord God of hosts. And he remembers, you know, as he's reading God's word, he remembers who the Lord is. And it, it, there's something very significant about this because when he says the, the Lord of hosts or the Lord God of hosts, that's God's battle name. When, when, when he's going to war, he is the Lord of hosts, the host, the armies of heaven. He has angels. Remember when they were arresting Jesus and, and he told Peter, put the sword away? He said, man, I could call down legions of angels right now. This is not even a big deal. I can call down the armies of heaven right now. It's not even hard. But he willingly went to the cross. You see, the Lord, he is the Lord of hosts. And he, he, he commands the armies of angels. And we remember his great power, his great authority, that no one can stand against him. God always wins. And we're on his team. God always wins and we're on his team. How great a deal is that? 
He's the Lord of hosts. He fights for you. He fights for you. He loves you. Man, when you read God's word, that's why we emphasize so much and we encourage so much. Man, just spend time in the word. You know, there, there's so much fighting against you spending time in the word with the Lord. Spend quality time with the Lord. It doesn't take a long time, but just take some time every day to spend time in the word of God. Because as you do, you will remember who you are to God and you will remember who God is to you. And it puts things in perspective and it will restore the joy. You know, if you've lost joy in your life, it is likely because you have lost time in the word of God, spending time with Jesus in the word of God. But to spend time in his presence, to spend time uh, learning of him and, and, and hearing from him, it brings joy and rejoicing into our lives. And what else can we have besides this joy <laughs> Well, we can have peace. You know, that's the last thing uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, this morning. Look at verse uh, 5. It says, But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He says, Do not be afraid. I highlighted that in my Bible. And look at verse 10. What is, you know, the, the angel is just the messenger of God. God sends the messenger uh, to relay the message to the people. But then what does Jesus say in verse 10? Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Two times. You know, this is just a matter of minutes. They leave the tomb. They're running away. The angel told them, don't be afraid. And then they meet Jesus on the way. And what does he say? Do not be afraid afraid you know we don't have to be afraid in a world that is full of fear we don't have to be afraid or live in fear but instead what we can enjoy is the peace of God you know oftentimes we say the opposite of fear is faith and when you have faith in God it brings peace you get to enjoy peace with God and you know what what kind of peace do we have we have Peace with God. You know, that's what Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans in chapter 5. He says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, because we put our faith in God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, before we knew the Lord, before we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we were enemies of God. We were fighting against God. We were in rebellion against God. And we did not have peace with God. But then when we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, or when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, all of a sudden we have peace with God. We're no longer fighting against him, but we get to just enjoy being with him. Again, to remember, hey, we're on his team. We belong to him, that he loves us and he cares for us. And, and where we were running away and we were fighting against the things of God because we were running after our sin, you know, when God opens our eyes and, and we make that decision to receive him and to accept him and acknowledge the truth that he's presented to us, then all of a sudden we can have peace with God. And wherever there is sin or wherever there is something that the, that the flesh starts to, to rise up, we know what to do with it. Because all we have to do is just take this and bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, this is in my heart. Lord, this is what I've done. Lord, this is what I said. Lord, this is what I've been thinking. And God, I recognize that it's not, it's not good. I, I recognize that it's not true. I, I recognize that it's not what you want for me. And so, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. And we bring those things to the Lord and he washes us and cleanses us and we're at peace with God once again. He removes our sin. He removes that iniquity. He removes those transgressions so that we can be at peace with the Lord once again. But to know this, man, we have peace with God. And not only do we have peace with God, we get to enjoy the peace of God. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to end there this morning. Philippians chapter 4. If you've ever... You know, done a word study or a subject study on peace. Uh, I guarantee you probably landed here in Philippians chapter 4 rather quickly uh, because th this is one of those key verses or key passages uh, that talks about just enjoying peace uh, as we walk with the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 4. 
I love how he starts. Rejoice, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Man, remember who the Lord is. Rejoice in him always. You know, every day, rejoice in who the Lord is and what he's done for you. Again, I will say rejoice. He reiterates this and repeats it. Uh, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And, And what did Paul encourage the church at Philippi with? He said, don't be anxious for anything. You know, what is, what, is, what is that anxiousness? What is that anxiety? It's fear. Because we're afraid. There's, it, it, our, our peace has been stolen. And so we're anxious. We're left with anxiety. We're left with fear. We're left with a troubled heart. And he says, look, there there's, shouldn't be anything in this life that can just take over and steal your joy and steal your peace. He says, but when you, when you start to experience that, when you start to recognize that in your life, he says, but in everything. What does everything mean? Everything. Everything in your life. Is it starting to bring some fear? Is it starting to bring some worry, some anxiety into your life? You know, Sometimes we think that God only has time for the really big things in our lives, the big problems. But I love that he says everything. Because there are so many things throughout the day that that we might say, well, that's just a little thing. I'm just a little anxious or I'm just a little worried about that. And God says, I don't care. Bring it to me because I care about the little things. And, And God will work in the little things and not just the big things. But he says in everything, even in the little things of life that we think, well, I don't want to bother God with that. Understand this, you're never a bother to God. He loves to hear from his children. He's a good father. He's way better than us, you know, at being parents. But he's always got time for us. We're never bothering him. We're never, we're never troubling him. He says, no matter how small you think the thing is or how big you think the thing is, God is concerned about it, and God wants to work in our hearts and in our situation. And he will if we give him the chance. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So he says, look, in in everything in life, you know, whatever's starting to worry you or bring fear into your life, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Bring it to the Lord in supplication. That's just praying to God and saying, Lord, we need your help. Lord, we need you to help in this situation. We don't have enough or we can't do this on our on our own. God, we need your help. And so he says, bring it to the Lord that way with thanksgiving. And with thanksgiving is with faith because this is what we get to pray. Lord, we need your help. We don't know what to do or, or we don't have the ability to do what needs to be done here. And so, God, we're praying for your help. And, Lord, we are thanking you ahead of time for what you're going to do because we know you're God. We know that you are powerful. We know that this is easy for you and we are your people. And so, God, we just need your help and we thank you for what you're going to do. He says, man, come to the Lord that kind of way. Man, when you pray, pray in faith. Pray thanking the Lord, but bring those things, whether small or big or medium-sized or however you, however you want to you know, measure those things for yourself. God says, hey, it's all easy for him, and he's concerned about all of those things. But make your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, if we will do this, this is the result. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, you say, man, this doesn't make sense. I can't understand how can you have peace in this type of situation? How can I enjoy peace uh, in in this situation? I should be freaking out. They should be freaking out. I should be overwhelmed. You know, they should be losing it right now, right? He says, but this is what I have for you. This is what the Lord has for you, he says. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It just doesn't even make sense, but it's the peace of God, and it will guard your hearts, and it will guard your minds through Christ Jesus. You can enjoy God's peace as you go through your day, as you go through your week, and as you go through your life. We have this because of the resurrection of Jesus. We get to enjoy this with him because of what Jesus has done for us. 
And then he goes on to a list of things. He says, look, it's important what we think about. Finally, brethren, whatever things, verse 8, are true. You know, think about things are true. Don't think about lies or I don't know if that's true. Don't, don't think about those things. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you as you meditate on those good things. You know, what we think about, what we meditate on, it affects us and it affects our peace. And if we're meditating and thinking on the things of this world, that can bring a lot of anxiety, that can bring a lot of fear. If we're meditating and thinking on what I'm able to do and, and what my responsibility is, that can bring a lot of fear, that can bring a lot of anxiety and overwhelming. But if I'm thinking on what is true, who God is and what God has done for me and what God can do to enable me to follow him and be obedient to him, then my eyes are on Jesus. My thoughts and my thinking are on Jesus and not myself and not the world around me. And it makes all of the difference. And we get to enjoy this because of the resurrection of Jesus. He's given us this ability to enjoy his peace and to be able to do it every single day. You know, Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And you see, that's how we, we grow in grace, and, and that's how we have that peace multiplied in our lives is because we're growing in our knowledge of Jesus. As we spend time meditating on the word, as we spend time serving the Lord, as we spend time uh, fellowshipping together with other believers, our mind uh, you know, is continually placed back upon those things of Jesus and the things of the word of God and the things of God. And then all of a sudden we, we have a greater understanding of God's grace and we have God's peace multiplied in our hearts and multiplied in our lives. But it comes through that knowledge of God and of Jesus, spending time doing the things that will draw us closer to Jesus so we can learn of him and learn more about him. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And God will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is fixed on the Lord on the things of the Lord, you remember, hey, I can trust the Lord. I can trust him. He's for me. He loves me. God loves me. And you can trust him. The more you learn of him, the, Lord, the more uh, you grow in your relationship with him, the more you can trust him. And it brings that perfect peace into our lives as our mind is just fixed on him. As the band comes up, we're going we're gonna to finish there. Um, I think Paul wraps it up pretty well in Romans chapter 15. I'll put it up on the screen for you. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, we have hope, we have joy, and we have peace all because of Jesus. Man, this is what we get to enjoy and I guess uh, the question to ask now is this, you know, do you have this hope? Do you have this hope in your heart this morning? You know, are you experiencing just the joy of the Lord and the peace that God gives? And if you aren't and you want it, if you want to have this hope, if you want to have this joy and have this peace, all you have to do is ask. He said, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and just ask the Lord, Lord, do this in my life. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe you rose again from the dead. Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sin. Make me one of yours, one of your Christians. You can ask and the Lord will do it in your life just like he has in so many others. You know, maybe you are born again. Maybe you know the Lord, but, man, just something has gotten in the way. Maybe 
there's just something that's going on in life and you know, you're just not enjoying that relationship with Jesus as you used to. And there are things that are getting in the way. You know, if there, if there is something or if there is some sin, confess it this morning. Allow God to just release that, uh, release you of it, to, to, to forgive you and to, and, and to cleanse you. If you will confess it to him, if you will ask for forgiveness, he will forgive you. And he will wash you clean like it never happened. And you can get a fresh start, a new beginning with him this morning. And maybe it's you, you just sense you're not walking in his power. And if you just need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, ask him. And God will fill you fresh and new with his Holy Spirit so that you can live for him and glorify him. And you can enjoy just having that hope and enjoy the joy and the peace that he has for you this morning want that this morning just ask and he'll give it to you and we're going to worship for one more song and and if you need someone to pray with you if you'd like someone to pray with you we'll be down front and uh, let's just bring these things to the lord this morning and just for, ask for god to do that work in our hearts that only he can do amen all right let's worship
declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the resurrection one day will be with you. Lord, thank you for that promise. Lord, thank you for the hope that you've given us, Lord. Uh, bless each one of us this day, Lord, as we just go out full of your joy and your peace. God, thank you for being our God, and thank you for making us your people. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>